Uh, welcome to the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, classes begin next week, so this is a good time uh, when students uh, at any rate uh, and colleagues are quite relaxed. Uh, but I'm glad to see people from all kinds of other spheres of life. Um, I'm very pleased to uh, have uh, Toby Dalton here. Uh, just as a quick background to this talk, uh, the Center on Asia and Globalization, uh, of which I'm director, we've just completed a one and a half day workshop with uh, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and Security at, uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, Toby, of course, comes from Carnegie. Um, and that uh, workshop brought together uh, people from China, scholars uh, from China, uh, India, and Pakistan, but also from Britain and, of course, the United States. And the theme of the conference is cognate to this, uh, related to this, which is to say we talked about the the role uh, of nuclear weapons and security, uh, primarily in terms of India and Pakistan, but also uh, in terms of India-China, and China's uh, role and views uh, of, of the triangular relationship. Um, so out of that, I asked Toby, since he was going to be here, to give us a little bit extra time. Uh, I know he's quite tired, <laughs> but he's very kindly agreed to, to do this session. Um, he's going to speak for about four, 40 minutes or so and then open up to a Q&A. Um, the title of the talk is Coercion in the Nuclear Age, and uh, it's particularly concerned with how states uh, respond to the threats of nuclear coercion, uh, uh, for instance, from uh, places like North Korea and, and Pakistan. Uh, I won't read the rest of his abstract here. He's going to explain to himself, but let me say something about Toby. Uh, he's co-director of the Nuclear Policy Program uh, at uh, the Carnegie Endowment for international peace. Um, uh, he's had a, a varied and distinguished career, of course. He's an expert on non-proliferation and nuclear energy, uh, and his work addresses regional security challenges and the evolution of the global nuclear order. I think a lot of us have sort of turned away from nuclear issues over the last five or seven years or so, uh, but it is a, an, an area where a lot of changes are happening, and, and Toby, of course, has uh, stuck with these issues. Uh, he's particularly focused on uh, South Asia and East Asia. Uh, among his published works uh, with uh, George Perkovich, who was also here from Carnegie, is Not War, Not Peace, Motivating Pakistan to Prevent Cross-Border Terrorism. This is an Oxford University Press book from 2016. And with Alexandra Francis, South Korea's Search for Nuclear Sovereignty, uh, published by Asia Policy, January 2015. Before uh, he was at the Carnegie Endowment, he served for a decade as an official at the U.S. Department of Energy, um, working on non-proliferation. Uh, during this time, he was senior policy advisor to the Office of Non-Proliferation and International Security, uh, and was posted as energy attache at the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad. Quite an interesting time, uh, I'm sure, uh, in quite a uh, turbulent uh, uh, country. Uh, and served as a professional staff member at the U.S. Uh, Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. He's been a research fellow also at the uh, Institute for Eastern, for Far Eastern Studies in Seoul, uh, South Korea. He holds a PhD in public policy. Good to see it's from public policy school. Uh, George Washington University, an MA in political science from the University of Washington, and a BA in diplomacy and world affairs from Occidental College. And I think you said you're from Seattle, so mm. the rain's making you feel very quite much at home. So quite at home. Uh, please join me in welcoming Toby to our midst. And with that, it's all yours. Well, thanks, Kanti. It's a pleasure to be here. And thanks to all of you for braving the rain to, to come out this evening. And also the rather esoteric title for, for this talk. Uh, I can imagine that, uh, uh, I mean, this topic puts me to sleep sometimes, so I can imagine <laughs> that uh, that might not have been the most obvious, uh, obvious top topic for a, a talk to come to. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll use that topic mostly as a way to, to dive in and try to understand a little bit more about what's happening with North Korea. Uh, and so that's the, the focus that I'll, I'll give. Um, but as an entry point for this broader topic of um, the, the problem that many states confront now of, of coercion uh, in a world with very complex uh, deterrence relationships. Um, and specifically, the, the challenge that states confront and what to do uh, when nuclear weapons are used as a cover for acts uh, that transgress common norms or the UN Charter. Uh, so I'm thinking here, for instance, of North Korea's threats against South Korea, uh, Russia's activity in eastern Ukraine and Crimea, um, Pakistan's uh, tolerance or even uh, sponsorship 
of groups that have carried uh, out attacks against India. Um, now, in the age of Trump tweets uh, about the size of his nuclear button and so forth, it's also fair to ask whether the US might fall uh, into this category, and, and some could certainly perceive uh, as, as much. Uh, I'll mostly set that issue aside, but I'm happy to return to it in the discussion if people want to take it up. I think the question that leaders have to grapple with when confronted with coercive nuclear threats is how to respond in a way that obviates the threat but avoids escalation. Uh, and for a variety of reasons, mostly rooted in politics and psychology, states tend to gravitate toward punitive options. And yet, most of those options that are considered actually increase the risks that conflict could escalate uh, and that deterrence could fail, uh, raising the possibility of damage or casualties far in excess of whatever the initial transgressive uh, threat or act might have been. Uh, it is exceedingly difficult for states to identify an appropriate course of action in the face of these kinds of coercive threats. Uh, if you don't respond, you can erode deterrence and invite more attacks. If you respond too much, you risk escalation. Uh, I think, as a good example, India has wrestled with the problem uh, of terrorism coming from Pakistan for 30 or more years and has yet to articulate, let alone practice, a coherent strategy uh, in response. So I'm going to focus much of the talk on analyzing the challenge presented by North Korea, but uh, this isn't just a North Korea problem. Uh, the incidence of this kind of problem, I think, is likely to increase in the future as power in the international system fragments and asymmetries between states to include states with nuclear weapons continue to grow. And the framework that I hope to arrive at by the end and, and that you take away um, that adheres to this new, new nuclear age that I all describe um, is that it is better for states to avoid responding to coercion only with coercion uh, and instead to come up with something that is more like a hybrid approach. Um, and uh, the, the term that I'll use for this is uh, motivation, uh, that you use forceful options combined with reassurance that those options won't be used uh, in order to deal with this kind of coercive threat. This may seem obvious, but as you look around the world and, and look in particular for evidence of the, these kinds of policies, it's, you don't actually see them discussed very often, uh, whether in the US, uh, among NATO members, and, and how to respond to Russia, uh, or in India or, or other places. So the context for this is what I've described in the title of this talk as the new nuclear age. Now, most of what we know or we think we know about coercion and deterrence and the presence of nuclear weapons is heavily informed by the US-Soviet experience, uh, and mainly from the 1960s to the 1980s. And by we, I'm associating myself with a community <coughs> of mostly Western strategic analysts who think about these issues. Uh, and so you understand the potential bias that, that I'm coming uh, with uh, uh, that's inherent from that perspective. Uh, I think that Western literature has influenced, um, perhaps more as a reference point, uh, Chinese thinking and Pakistani nuclear thinking. I think it's probably less influential in India. Um, I'm not sure about North Korea because there's <coughs> not a lot that's, that's very much known about how, how North Korean leaders think about nuclear weapons, um, but I'll return to that in, in a few minutes. The nuclear world today, however, is vastly different than the world in which thinking developed about coercion uh, and deterrence in the presence of nuclear weapons. For one, there are more states with nuclear weapons, uh, with arsenals of various size and capability. The leaders of these states may hold very different views and beliefs about the circumstances under which nuclear weapons might be used, uh, under which they have political, military, or diplomatic value, uh, namely for coercion. They may have learned lessons from recent examples. Um, for example, uh, the uh, effects uh, of the um, action in Libya uh, after Gaddafi decided to uh, dispose of his weapons of mass destruction, uh, weapons of mass destruction programs, uh, or Saddam Hussein's Iraq, or even Iran leading up to the negotiation of the nuclear deal with the EU 3 plus 3. It's also the case that in this new nuclear age, the linkage between conventional military <coughs> conflict and nuclear escalation is weaker than it had been assumed in the US-Soviet context, raising questions about the space that exists for limited conflict. There's also a concern that the use of nuclear weapons for some states may not be a last resort, but rather an early option uh, to forestall potential losses of a sustained conflict. 
think it's also fair to say that the global distribution of power and resources is vastly different than it was 30 years ago, meaning the asymmetries among states with nuclear weapons matter a great deal for how they perceive and might seek to use coercion, and thus also has implications for stability. And of course, we see evolving technologies that may interact with nuclear uh, weapons, uh, particularly in the communications and command and control space, uh, cyber capabilities, for instance. So these are, I think, what are some of the hallmarks of the new nuclear age. You can look for scholarship on the second nuclear age, or I mean, there's probably any number of ways that you could count nuclear ages if you want to. I'm just trying to differentiate, I think, what <coughs> the sort of standard literature is that's older from the, the newer circumstances that we face today. And it stands to reason, given the differences between the old and the new, that we should think critically about what we know or what we believe about coercion and nuclear weapons. And this is uh, an area of increasing ferment uh, and academic debate, uh, certainly in the US, but also in Europe, I think in, in China and elsewhere. And so my remarks today kind of pick up threads uh, of that debate. To make sure we're on the same page, I want to offer a couple definitions uh, just up front here. Uh, first, uh, coercion, as I'm thinking about it, broadly involves making threats in order to achieve, achieve some specific uh, outcome. One type of coercion is deterrence, uh, which is essentially about defending the status quo, using threats to get others not to do something that they might otherwise be tempted or are planning to do. Another form of coercion, uh, what the American economist and game theorist Thomas Schelling termed compellence, is a bit the opposite, using leverage or force to change the status quo in a way that better suits your interest, to compel somebody to, to do something. Uh, I have a, a five-year-old daughter, and I find that analogies involving young children are often good uh, examples of, of deterrence. Um, so my daughter is delightful, um, but she likes to probe some of the boundaries of acceptable behavior. Uh, <laughs> and so we try to defend those boundaries, usually through threat of punishment or, or denial. So, you know, eat your vegetables or no sweets, things like that. How old is she? Uh, five and a half. Uh, <laughs> yes. uh, you take your, uh, your uh, vocation very seriously. Mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, another important point uh, is that what we know about nuclear coercion or deterrence, or what we think we know, the epistemology of this subject, is, is mostly based on economic assumptions about interests and behavior, and about the structure of power in the international system. And a hallmark of that study, and specifically of, of nuclear coercion and deterrence, is that it has largely been deductive and heavily influenced by game theory. I mentioned uh, Thomas Schelling before, who was, in the US context, particularly important in classifying and understanding predicted behaviors and potential outcomes of nuclear confrontations based on game theory. And he used this analogy of the game of chicken a lot to explain uh, the stakes involved uh, and why the probability of deterrence failure is actually much higher than, than many people would otherwise assume. Uh, and he uses this game of, of chicken, um, which is kind of like, you know, akin to two people approaching each other on, on one-lane road. Uh, and, and they're trying to signal each other to see who's going to, to give way. And I noticed that the traffic here is rather orderly and people obey the rules, and so perhaps this analogy doesn't work as well here. It, it works quite, quite nicely in South Asia, um, where the, the traffic is a, is a little more chaotic. But yeah, you is not allowed here. No, I think, I think probably not. Um, but in any case, the, the signaling is often or easily misinterpreted. You know, people honk the horns or flash the lights, and is that uh, trying to say that, you know, you should go first or that I'm going first or that, um, you know, I'll give way or uh, if, I, if I flash the lights uh, or, I, you know, I accidentally toggle the wipers, what does that mean? I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the challenge that you can see in the signaling is... is um, uh, quite quite difficult. And then there are potential other complications too. What if the road is, you know, it's raining and so it's harder to maneuver your car uh, at the last minute. So obviously the, the game of chicken between two drivers occasionally ends poorly uh, if, if one doesn't give way. Uh, and so you can, you can see that the results if both drivers are armed with nuclear weapons uh, could be particularly catastrophic uh, given the perception or the potential for, for misperception uh, or, or accident. Um, the driving in Washington is uh, also high stakes, uh, and ego is involved. Uh, and uh, I think we can see that uh, uh, in the, the, I'll use the Trump tweets quite a bit just because it's convenient, but ego is involved uh, on the, the nuclear side in the US uh, quite a bit these days. What's interesting though is that in real life, there isn't actually a lot of evidence for the game of nuclear chicken. Uh, 
Um, and in all of this literature about coercion and deterrence involving nuclear weapons, the amount of real world evidence uh, is quite small. Um, and given that it's more deduction than the data, it's probably more intellectually honest to say that deterrence and, and nuclear coercion is less science or even art and, and probably more like religion, um, a, a belief system about how the world works uh, and a, a narrative that is based on some observed experience but understood through the lens of, of a higher power. Uh, and in this instance, we <coughs> have only one instance of that power ever having been used uh, over 70 years ago when the U.S. Uh, used nuclear weapons twice uh, in Japan to conclude the Second World War. Um, um, and we only have two direct military confrontations involving, or conflicts involving states uh, with nuclear weapons uh, on which to, to draw evidence um, between China uh, and the Soviet Union in 1969 and between <coughs> India and Pakistan uh, in 1999. Everything that has happened since when states have used threats uh, of nuclear coercion or when there have been you know, the potential for, for violence, um, you know, all of that uh, is evidence that is accorded to the, the power of nuclear weapons. Um, but, and, and we've come to believe that, that this has power and, and use this evidence, I, you know, whether it's positive or, or dispositive, to, to demonstrate that nuclear weapons have shaped the behavior of states and, and outcomes of crises. Again, this is more, um, in my contention, a, a matter of belief and interpretation of events through this lens of, of uh, nuclear religion and not necessarily empirically true. I think it's also important to, to note uh, that notwithstanding your, your point that, that nuclear issues have kind of declined a little bit over the last few years, which I think is true, um, n notwithstanding you know, picking up the paper and seeing some things, um, that this religion is alive and well. Uh, and seems to be growing in the number of adherents um, and maybe even acolytes. Um, I think many people continue to see nuclear weapons as ultimate weapons, that they have some sort of mythical power. Uh, they're given still considerable status in the international system, but they have really pernicious side effects when it comes to state policies. The countries that have acquired them inevitably want more. Military services uh, find uh, new ways to, to use them. Uh, often to the, the detriment of other capabilities that might be more uh, useful. Uh, new roles or missions for nuclear weapons are easily imagined. They become kind of a solution in search of a problem. Uh, and we're in the middle of this debate right now in Washington. Literally this, this week, um, we're soon anticipating uh, a, a document that is released every four or eight years, depending on the administration, that's called the Nuclear Posture Review. Uh, and this document describes how the U.S. will use nuclear weapons uh, in its national security strategy. And uh, we're anticipating the expenditure of over a trillion U.S. dollars in the next several decades to modernize uh, the U.S. nuclear program. Um, but this isn't only a U.S. phenomenon. Uh, I think if you look around the world, there is not a state that has nuclear weapons today, not Russia, China, the U.K., France. India, Pakistan, Israel, or North Korea, in addition to the United States, that isn't planning to retain nuclear weapons for decades to come, but isn't thinking about ways to posture them in order to be able to make the broadest possible use of their coercive effects. So this is the, the context, uh, this, this new nuclear age for, for how you deal with the problems uh, of, of uh, coercive diplomacy backed by nuclear threats, uh, and doing so in a way that doesn't increase risks escalation of conflict leading to nuclear use. Um, so the challenge for states on the receiving end of these coercive th threats is how to respond in a way that sustains deterrence and manages the risk of escalation. Which leads us to North Korea. Uh, so obviously North Korea has been in the news quite a bit uh, over the last few years um, and much of that news uh, highlighting this problem of, of coercion, uh, the potential for coercion. Um, They've been testing an awful lot. Uh, they, in just in, in the last year, tested nuclear weapons twice. The last one they claimed to be a thermonuclear uh, device. They have tested uh, a range of ballistic missiles of increasing range and sophistication, uh, now to include two types of missiles that have intercontinental range, uh, and testing them under increasingly realistic conflict uh, conditions. They have voiced shrill warnings to the United States uh, about their willingness to use nuclear weapons to target uh, the U.S., um, both military facilities in the region, uh, at which U.S. military personnel are, are stationed and capabilities are based, uh, but also the continental United States. 
Um, they're broadcast images of Kim Jong-un looking at, at targeting maps. And I think most US analysts who look at and, and track the program in, in North Korea uh, believe that if they don't have it already in the next year, they'll soon have uh, that capability to actually be able to target uh, the US. Uh, it may have had less notice, um, but I think it's fair to also say that North Korea's behavior has spawned considerable discussion uh, in several capitals, not least uh, in Washington, about what to do about it. Um, a debate that is characterized by negotiation on one end of the spectrum uh, and military preemption on the other. Um, most of that discussion, and, and certainly in Washington and other places too, uh, tends to be concentrated on the use of force. So countering coercion with coercion. Uh, and over the last few months in particular, Washington has been rife with speculation about and rumors about the preparation of military options uh, to bolster the economic sanctions that have been levied through the UN Security Council um, to, to address this problem. Uh, South Korea is also uh, increasing its defense expenditure uh, on both offensive and defensive uh, military capabilities. It's also notable that in South Korea, which is a, a, a country that I visit often, um, some 60% of the population in public opinion polls uh, that has consistently over time feel sufficiently threatened by North Korean nuclear weapons that they would like their own. Uh, conservative South Korean politicians have been making the rounds regularly uh, in Washington asking the U.S. to deploy tactical nuclear weapons to enhance the credibility of the U.S. Uh, alliance commitment uh, to, to South Korea. Um, and some, <laughs> some of them have threatened that if the U.S. declines to station tactical nuclear weapons there, South Korea will pursue its own uh, nuclear weapons program. Uh, and it's hard to blame them, uh, given this persistent sense of, of existential threat uh, from North Korea. Uh, and, and also in the context of, of concerns about the reliability uh, of the U.S. As, a, uh, as an ally when there's a president of the United States that seems a little bit unreliable. <laughs> um, and until Kim Jong-un's New Year's speech last week, I think the trajectory didn't look good. Over the last couple of days, things look a, a little bit Better, but until then, you had American analysts predicting the chances of military conflict uh, at upwards of 50%. Uh, I've heard similar figures from, from Chinese analysts, too. So this was not uh, just an American threat perception. And that is a uniquely <coughs> alarming <coughs> prediction. Um, it's also an interesting prediction when, when you take the evidence that exists uh, that I mentioned before of only two instances of countries with nuclear weapons having been in military conflict before. So either these predictions are vastly overrated or we have so little data that we can't actually make useful predictions. Um, in any case, uh, the, the conclusion you can draw from that is that nuclear war on the Korean Peninsula may be as high as a matter of chance at this point um, and with potential global consequences. But I think this dynamic is also a good example of how the new nuclear age challenges assumptions or ideas from the old nuclear age. North Korea is small, weak, and poor relative to the United States. It is using nuclear weapons largely to offset conventional military weakness and to deter a perceived uh, existential threat to its regime. Uh, its view <coughs> of the stakes of confrontation are far different uh, than for the United States. It experiences the threat of military conflict in a very uh, conflict in a very local way, and so the psychology of conflict is embedded in the North Korean <coughs> identity and strategic culture, uh, and in important ways given its history and circumstances. Whereas for Washington, this is a very distant theater, an entire ocean away, and you've had <coughs> some U.S. politicians, including uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, uh, stating publicly uh, as a corollary to their support for preemptive military options that we should do that now because the conflict would stay over there in Asia and not come to the United States. Uh, so US and North Korean interests are, are not equal. They're asymmetric. And that produces a vastly different risk calculus for the two ac actors. And it can work in, in different ways. Uh, so for example, limited action uh, by the US, um, you know, some sort of uh, symbolic or, or preemptive strike, may be perceived by North Korean leaders as a precursor to a total war. Uh, their ability to d differentiate between those things uh, isn't clear, meaning that the risk propensity for nuclear use or inadvertent es escalation is much greater than models uh, derived from U.S.-Soviet experience might suggest. Or North Korea might also calculate that U.S. risk aversion means that 
North Korea could employ <coughs> nuclear weapons for coercion uh, to try to split the alliance by threatening to attack South Korea or Japan unless U.S. forces, forces stationed there uh, are withdrawn. Now, these may be worst case assumptions on either end, but they animate the war planning uh, that the United States and South Korea and probably North Korea uh, does. Depending on the strategies in which it might employ them, North Korea's nuclear and missile developments may also give North Korea new options for blackmail or bargaining. So the security challenge for the United States and South Korea then in the future will be much more complicated as a result. They must try to deter a broader range of aggressive North Korean behavior if North Korea indeed becomes emboldened by the perceived power of nuclear weapons. And North Korean actions backed by nuclear threats could, Im you could imagine uh, at the low end, maybe much more uh, uh, extensive cyber attacks uh, or some sort of action in the DMZ or over the DMZ or other sort of gray zone uh, operations intended to test uh, the resilience of the U.S.-South Korea alliance uh, and their reactions with a view towards uh, what we call salami slicing uh, the alliance and, and eroding the credibility of the U.S. defense commitment uh, to South Korea. So calibrating responses to these kinds of actions must reconcile what might successfully deter them with the need to manage the potential for escalation should deterrence fail. And the most difficult challenge posed by North Korea's nuclear weapons is the possibility that North Korea can win, or maybe more accurately, not lose, through escalation by raising the inherent risk of nuclear use in any crisis. If the conflict does escalate, and North Korean leaders fear for their uh, survival, they might risk using nuclear weapons first, perhaps in a, li in a limited way uh, on the Korean Peninsula or against US forces uh, in the region. But they can credibly threaten to use nuclear weapons against a range of assets valued by adversaries because decision makers in Washington and Seoul know that Kim Jong-un and other North Korean leaders may perceive that they will be no worse off than they already were if they were perceiving some sort of existential threat to the regime. Uh, this is an illustration of the old adage that you can't hang a man twice. And so this could be a rational strategy from, from North Korea's point of view uh, to use nuclear weapons to guarantee uh, regime survival. Now, whether North Korea thinks, whether North Koreans think in these terms or not is another matter. But Western analysts think they might, maybe because of mirror imaging or not. And so we need to consider the implications for how to confront this potential uh, for North Korean nuclear coercion. Um, so let me offer a few implications uh, and observations that will serve to bridge uh, this uh, issue to a broader framing. Uh, first, the U.S. and South Korean approach to confronting North Korea over the last decade has been primarily punitive, uh, whether it's economic sanctions or threatening military action or otherwise. Um, and so it provides, I think, interesting insights into the problem of power asymmetry uh, and, and coercion in the new nuclear age. Uh, slight asterisk here, the South Korean president who was elected last year um, favors engagement with North Korea much more than his, his immediate predecessors did. Um, and, but he's been bound or, or um, boxed in by the more coercive U.S. approach. Um, second, uh, the assumptions about North Korean intentions guided very much by this religious view of the power of nuclear weapons are in contradiction with historical evidence, uh, with what historical evidence does exist about the effectiveness uh, of nuclear coercion. And there's some good academic literature on that subject. And third, the hype that we see in a lot of the media coverage uh, about uh, North Korea um, makes the, the fears of coercion, potential coercion in the future, these worst case assumptions basically, drive responses that probably increase the risk of deterrence failure and ultimately the use of nuclear weapons. Let me un unpack each of those three points. First, if you were to survey experts in Washington or <coughs> just look at the media coverage uh, of the governmental deliberations uh, about the U.S. approach uh, to North Korean nuclear emboldenment, <coughs> you, you would find that the options under consideration are exclusively punitive and primarily military in orientation. Um, sanctions has been the primary tool for now, but the debate going forward is very much about uh, military options. Um, and these include discussions of special operations, precision strikes on, on missiles or uh, related facilities, or even wholesale preemption of North Korea's nuclear infrastructure uh, 
um, to include uh, the possibility of, of regime change. Uh, the, and these are over and above the, the sanctions um, that have been slowly built uh, over the last uh, decades. Um, there are a few solitary voices that, that tend to argue for diplomacy, but the space for considering reassurance or inducements is quite narrow. And you only need to look at the record of, of uh, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson uh, offering the potential for dialogue, um, which usually results in a Trump tweet uh, along the lines of, you know, don't bother, Rex. Um, so the focus, I think, has, has pretty much, uh, and, the, and the process, as, as uh, we understand it, has pretty much eschewed uh, the possibility of negotiation until now. And the reasons for this punitive focus are several and interwoven. Uh, first, you can look at the failure of past uh, negotiated uh, outcomes and agreements uh, with North Korea, and it makes it much easier to argue that diplomacy won't work in the future. Uh, second, anyone who argues for other than military options is essentially branded as weak or worse an appeaser. Uh, third, past U.S. and South Korean deterrence threats uh, have been eroded, and the impetus is therefore to keep adding more capability uh, to try to restore uh, that, uh, that deterrence, despite uh, not much evidence to suggest that any of this added capability actually changes uh, North Korea's deterrence calculus or behavior. Uh, and fourth, there are quite strong demands from South Korea uh, on the U.S. to do more to reassure them uh, about the credibility of the U.S. defense commitment. And the most ready symbols of, of reassurance tend to be offensive military hardware. There's also something a little bit more subtle at work, um, and I alluded to it earlier. The U.S. is a big power and sees itself in a big power, uh, as a big power in the international system, um, as a superpower or, or, or what. Um, and Americans aren't used to facing threats to U.S. territory, sort of setting aside the existing Chinese and, and Russian nuclear threats. The last time there was an attack on the U.S. homeland in 9-11, the U.S. declared war on two countries and all of the global consequences uh, that resulted we can see. So here is this perceived backward state headed by a guy who seems crazy, who's a dynastic dictator who we don't understand, who seems to be wanting to blackmail uh, us through the potential of, of nuclear coercion. And so this is why Trump says he won't allow or won't stand for North Korea being able to target the U.S. Um, the inclination on his part is, and, and I think actually predecessors too, is to deny that this capability uh, is exist or to try to destroy uh, that capability, not to try to deter it. But without any understanding or, or conception of, of the risks and potential consequences, whether to South Korea or the region, to the U.S. or, or even the world, of, of failure uh, to do so. Um, so you have the U.S. not wanting to accept the idea essentially that it is vulnerable uh, to North Korea because vulnerability means some level of mutual deterrence which in turn means that you have to accept constraints on or limits on military options in order to avoid escalation. And you can't also ignore the, the politics of this too. Uh, domestically it is much easier to explain and build political support for military options. It makes you look strong. We can say that bravado uh, is important for domestic ratings, something that Trump knows a great deal about. Uh, and if people don't, even if people don't wish to, to see conflict. Internationally, uh, reputation uh, is an important commodity and uh, really important in deterrence. And so if it looks like your deterrence is being eroded or your power is, is weakened by a small state that can essentially hold you at bay, um, that means adversaries, other adversaries might be emboldened to try to coerce you as well. On the second point, I mentioned this academic literature that uh, has evaluated specifically whether nuclear coercion has been successful when it's been attempted in the past. Uh, and this work tends to find that actually very rarely does it work, and only under extreme and limited circumstances. And the reasons for this are fairly obvious. Nuclear weapons have very limited military utility compared to most other conventional options. Carrying through on a coercive nuclear threat has very high costs given the potential for retaliation, not to mention the international <coughs> reaction uh, that would come with that. Uh, and in, for the most part in the past, uh, the stakes involved uh, uh, in attempts at nuclear coercion have been too low to make those threats credible. Uh, it's also very difficult to demonstrate through signaling uh, that, uh, you're, that it's a, a credible threat, uh, which makes it also not very effective. 
So there's a bit of a disconnect here between the academic findings about the success of nuclear coercion and our concern about the potential for North Korean uh, coercion. Um, now, this literature is mostly backward looking as much political science is, and so we have to accept that there are probably some limitations uh, with the data and analysis. But it does raise questions uh, about whether our understanding of North Korean threats uh, or our hyping of North Korean threats is maybe too much. Um, and, but I think the one thing that we, we have to worry about in the context of this new nuclear age is, is uh, the power asymmetry. Uh, and, uh, and, and also the asymmetry of stakes involved. Much higher for North Korea, lower for the US. Um, and so that could make North Korean course of nuclear threats more effective uh, than the academic literature might suggest. Um, and it's also notable that the reputational costs for North Korea may actually be the inverse of what the models suggest. That in fact, uh, North Korea could help develop a nuclear export model if it's quite successful uh, in this regard. Um, as, an, as a proven strategy against big powers. But even so, North Korea runs uh, huge, maybe even existential risks uh, in trying to manage escalation without uh, miscalculation. And the academic literature in this regard suggests that in the early period after states acquire nuclear weapons, they're more likely to assume greater risks because they, they believe that nuclear weapons are valuable and they want to use this thing that they've spent a lot of time and effort developing. Um, over time, they learn that coercion doesn't work. And so the, uh, the challenge or the, the impetus for states confronting a new nuclear state is to try to manage the potential for escalation in this early period um, to avoid escalatory pathways rather than playing into them. And fortunately, and, and this is the third point on, on this area, the, the fear of coercion and the, problems of, the problem of alliance credibility with South Korea um, for many of the political and reputational reasons that I mentioned, uh, is driving planning for punitive responses that probably increases the risks uh, of escalation if North Korea does attempt coercion in the future. So the open threats of fire and fury and not just a book title, uh, total destruction, <laughs> things that uh, President Trump has said in relation to North Korea in, in the past, coupled with the discussions of preemption, probably exacerbates North Korean perceptions that if they do not use nuclear weapons early in a confrontation with the US, they would risk losing them on what's uh, known as the use or lose dilemma. Uh, and in particular, the US and South Korean emphasis on developing precision strike uh, capabilities um, may make this problem worse, particularly uh, in, in, a, in a conflict. So we can take as implications of the North Korean case, uh, I think the following. Given the asymmetric stakes uh, involved in North Korean propensity for tactical adventurism in the past. Uh, the problem of conflict escalation in the presence of nuclear weapons is exceedingly dangerous. Um, but it, and, and that risk North Korea may seek to exploit um, rather than avoid uh, for, for its uh, strategic purposes. Um, but rather than playing into this strategy by matching coercion with coercion, it would make more sense for the United States and South Korea, particularly in this early period where North Korea may feel emboldened, um, to not respond uh, to that attempted coercion only with punitive means, um, and, and, and in particular means that might present a perceived threat of survival of the North Korean regime. This isn't a recipe for appeasement, I want to be clear, rather limiting or channeling coercive responses in ways that avoid the obvious pathways for uh, conflict to escalate. Um, and fundamentally, if you buy what I've, I've laid out here, the situation requires not just punitive threats, but also <coughs> signals of restraint and reassurance to avoid or mitigate misperception, uh, which could lead to inadvertent escalation. And so the signaling that we uh, give to North Korea uh, must comprise not only the expected punishment if North Korea transgresses certain norms or military thresholds, but also the expected restraint uh, in threatening regime survival if they don't. Um, so there has to be some sort of complementary uh, approach here of reassurance and, uh, of limits of punishment if we're to avoid uh, escalation. Otherwise, those risks tend to, to play into the hands of the state uh, that can assume higher risks, in this case, North Korea. Um, uh, there was another recent academic uh, study in the US that reviewed the effectiveness of coercion only versus coercion plus reassurance policies and confronting uh, challenges, uh, basically, you know, sticks alone versus sticks and carrots. Uh, and in exactly zero cases did coercion alone uh, work uh, in, in this study. This point may seem obvious. If you say to an adversary, if you cross the line, I'll shoot, 
in order to actually give them a choice, you also have to say, if you don't cross the line, I won't shoot. Otherwise, they may interpret that you're not really giving them the choice, uh, and that affects their, their incentives. Um, so I think that's uh, an important point. I had a lot of things on uh, psychology that I'll, I'll uh, skip for now, but can come back to you later. Um, uh, yeah, I apologize. <laughs> I have more notes than, uh, than time. Um, let me make um, sort of drawing on this uh, a few prescriptions about an alternative approach to North Korea that might make sense. Um, two assumptions to start with. Uh, one, the hierarchy of goals that we should have begins with preventing nuclear war. Everything after that we can you know, figure out, but that has to be our overriding priority. And second, that denuclearization of North Korea is not going to be achievable in the near term, and therefore we need to identify means of stability in the interim uh, that start with the premise of North Korea as a state that possesses nuclear weapons. So four prescriptions. First, um, and, and following from, from my analysis, we should cease activities or actions that contribute to muddled signaling and create risks of inadvertent escalation. Um, so this could include, uh, you know, changing the more provocative elements of U.S. military exercises, um, like flying nuclear-capable bombers, um, you know, up the Korean Peninsula in the direction of North Korea or along the DMZ. Um, probably speculating openly about uh, a so-called bloody nose attack, uh, which was uh, the subject of a Wall Street Journal article yesterday that describes uh, some of the planning that the Trump administration is doing. Um, Talking about these things um, probably is not very helpful, uh, and we should, we should be more restrained uh, if, we're, if we're going to have consistent signals. <coughs> Secondly, it would be to refocus military options away from punishment and focus more on uh, defense in order to deny uh, North Korea, or at least raise the costs to North Korea of attempted salami slicing, um, and to think about how to respond uh, to North Korean tactical provocations in a way that doesn't uh, lead to escalation. Third would be to find other non-military ways to punish North Korea uh, in addition to the economic sanctions without driving them towards some sort of desperation. Um, I think if you are concerned that military capabilities play into North Korea's hand, uh, we need to find non-military ways that actually create stress in the regime. Uh, it's notable that a couple summers ago there was uh, a, a kerfuffle about the loudspeakers that were set up along the DMZ, which South Korea uses to, to broadcast information in, into North Korea. Um, North Korea was, was quite exercised uh, about those, and I think the degree of concern betrayed uh, uh, a level of susceptibility to information warfare that could be exploited uh, in the future. And fourth and most important, I think, is that we need to find ways to um, signal and communicate uh, reassurance and restraint um, and a, a desire for security um, in, in the face of, of potential threats. Um, and in actions, not just in words, given that there's kind of a cacophony of words and uh, anyone would be forgiven for not having a clear picture of, of who is important in Washington these days. Um, I live in Washington. I don't have a clearer picture than anybody who lives outside, maybe even a, a worse picture. Um, so I think the messaging has to be, you know, attempts at nuclear coercion won't work uh, and those attempts will be defeated. Um, but if North Korea is restrained in its behavior, uh, the U.S. won't threaten Kim Jong-un's hold on power. Uh, basically, the I won't shoot you if you don't cross the line. Uh, but then in terms of actions, I think we also have to take steps that would be recognizable to North Korea as an attempt uh, to focus more on defense rather than uh, uh, offensive threats. Um, I think this kind of strategy would be more acceptable to China uh, and probably uh, be better at bringing China on, uh, on board. Uh, and also would suggest to the South Koreans that we're more concerned about their security uh, as, as well. So let me wrap up by um, sort of coming back to this idea of, of coercion in the new nuclear age. It's natural for states and in particular militaries to, to plan for and develop coercive, coercive means. Um, it's the role of policymakers to choose how to communicate when such means would be used and toward what end, um, and just as importantly, communicate when they wouldn't be used. Um, and it's common to hear the refrain, in, especially in Washington, that all options are on the table to deal with a particular problem. I find this language, um, which is kind of a code for military options and even in some cases nuclear options, to be really uh, unhelpful and, and problematic. Uh, threats alone especially if the target of the threats has nuclear weapons, uh, creates unnecessary tension uh, and it's unlikely to produce positive and stable outcomes. 
Instead, policymakers uh, should think of a, a broader framework of motivation uh, in confronting these challenges that combines uh, some coercive elements, uh, preferably uh, non-military ones, with reassurance uh, and, and restraint. Um, and I think that that um, decreases the probability of escalation and, and helps avoid some of the escalation pathways uh, that, that we might be concerned about. Um, this is a concept that uh, doesn't have a lot of theoretical framework in international relations. We have lots of, of theory about uh, war, um, less theory about war termination. And I think the, the same kind of phenomenon you, you see here, lots of uh, idea about how to use uh, coer coercion uh, and the study of coercion, less about reassurance and restraint. Um, Barry Posen has a, a new uh, book out about restraint as an American strategy, and so I think hopefully this is a sign uh, of uh, new scholarship to come. Um, but this is an underspecified and understudied uh, area, and so I, I, I recognize that. Um, this notion of offering reassurance to adversaries is understandably, I think, hard to swallow, and particularly for policymakers and, and elected politicians. But we have to be guided here by an understanding of the consequences of failure as a necessary counter to the confidence uh, of the nuclear priesthood, if you will, uh, whether they're in Pyongyang or in Washington, uh, and the ability to manage risks of escalation. Uh, and those consequences are potentially devastating um, and even global. So this is the, the challenge of the new nuclear age, that for scholars or practitioners, uh, we have to address this, uh, this risk. I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you. I'm Thank you very much. Out of gas. <coughs> <coughs> well, I think you've given us a lot, especially in North Korea, but also a, a tour through some of the conceptual kind of uh, challenges that we face uh, in terms of uh, thinking about the problem. But the floor is open, uh, and uh, so I, maybe I'll take one, or maybe two or three questions together, and then turn them to Toby. We have thirty minutes, roughly. Okay, James. <laughs> James Crabtree from the Center on Asia and Globalization. Yeah, well, just uh, this is it, it's being recorded, so uh, you will uh, have to ask a question into a mic and then say who you are. Sorry. So James Crabtree, Center on Asia and Globalization. Yeah. I'm by no means an expert on this topic. The approach that you outlined sounded very plausible and convincing. Hmm. Also sounded like the last thing that Donald Trump would ever think about doing. So in, in a sense, instead of saying what you think he should do, could you give us some insight on what you think he and his advisors on this issue are likely to do, um, given where they, they currently are, as opposed to the, the sort of more measured and sensible approach that you have outlined? Yep. Okay, we'll take the mic back there. Gentlemen, uh, sure. Thanks, Malcolm Cook from Yusof Ishak Institute. I had a question about the Chinese pressure against the FAD. So that looks like part of the new nuclear age or new dimension is overlapping and potentially conflicting deterrence games being played at the same time. Because you could certainly argue that FAD was an attempt to move away from offensive, that depends how you argue it, mm -hmm. towards defensive attempts to reduce the ability of North Korea to hit. But the Chinese put extreme pressure on that, not because they necessarily were wanting to strengthen North Korea's hand, but because they had a different consideration. So I was wondering, how does that play into all of this? Mm -hmm. Thanks. And one more here. Yeah. Uh, I'm Henry Chen from the East Asia Institute. My question is that actually there was very intense debate inside China uh, on what to do with North Korea. And it is very widely known that, that the president, uh, after the 19th Party Congress, is getting very tough. And his position is very unequivocally very close to uh, to the position that uh, North Korea will not should not be allowed to have nuclear arms. Now I want to know that what is your take that when uh, President Kim over a sudden change uh, position that fast, does it mean that uh, the Chinese uh, wholehearted engagement on the embargo really hurt the Korean ability, particularly in the access to the very critical parts on the nuclear weapons? And second is that we have been talking about uh, a toxic, uh, an implicit guarantee that uh, the Chinese have been proposing the U.S. Uh, on the survival of the Kim regime. But the problem is that, that the Kim regime, he is much uh, more dangerous than the Indian and Pakistan. Because these first two nuclear states, 
they are not really so eager in developing the delivery vehicles. And Kim has been very, very active in delivering the delivery vehicles. Now, if there's going to be this kind of a guarantee, and the Kim will ask you not to stop his programs, do you think that uh, there's going to be a very important serious leakage on the international nuclear area? He might export the technology if he's given access to more parts. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, so James, I could probably earn a lot of money if I knew what uh, <laughs> Trump might, uh, what the US is likely to do. Um, I think the, the narrative in Washington at this point is that you hear from lots of different parts of government is that, and there's, there's, there's two explanations for this, which I'll, I'll come to, but the narrative is there is a window of opportunity that continues to exist before North Korea will have a fully operational nuclear capability that could strike the US uh, in which if we're going to avoid that outcome, we have to do something. Uh, and that that window isn't going to be open for a whole lot longer and therefore there's a lot of pressure to do something sooner rather than later. <coughs> now, whether you interpret that as uh, an effort to get the Chinese to do more, to sort of raise the, the sense of threat to, to get China to do more, um, or whether they really believe that or not is, is hard to say. Uh, and there's evidence for both of those interpretations. Um, but, and sort of setting Trump aside because I'm not sure he knows what he believes on this issue from day to day or hour to hour or minute to minute. Um, <coughs> the, the seriousness with which they're, they seem to be exploring military options suggests that, that that's a real possibility. Um, and now the, the complication is you have in the near term, the Olympics coming, uh, and you have now the north-south talks that are ongoing. Uh, and if those go beyond the Olympics, then the US is going to be in this dilemma where it can't really risk some sort of military action <coughs> when South Korea is deeply in, engaged in these talks. Uh, and so that's going to compress the window of opportunity if it exists even more. Um, I, th I think it's, unlikely, my, my personal guess is that it's unlikely uh, that the military options will be taken, um, in large part because I don't think the US military wants to do it. Um, but when they're asked to prepare options, they have to respond. Now, they can do the analysis in a way that shows, um, you know, if, if you were to ask the question, well, what happens if you were to do X, Y, or Z, they can you know, give analysis that shows that it might be quite bad. Um, you know, in, in particular for the South Koreans. Um, so that, that's my, my guess, is that in, in the end, the, the military options won't come on. And we'll have to talk. Um, we'll have to talk with North Korea on the basis of um, not accepting it as a, as a legitimate nuclear state, um, but accepting the reality that we have to stabilize the situation in the near term uh, and, f and find ways to avoid escalation. Um, now, perhaps that's also wishful thinking on my part, but um, I, I, I think that's kind of the more likely outcome at this point. Um, uh, Malcolm, your question on the Chinese perception uh, or pressure on THAAD uh, and how does that play in? Um, I think you know China's had multiple objectives and it's been able to satisfy multiple objectives with a single course of action over time, which has largely been to not do a whole lot uh, about the North Korean nuclear program, uh, and I think. Yeah, in particular, uh, China has also been um, content to, to see opportunities uh, uh, to split the U.S.-South Korea alliance, or at least put pressure there uh, when, when they've existed. THAAD was, was one of those. Um, and, uh, and for those who don't know, THAAD stands for the Theater High Altitude Air Defense System. It's a sort of mid-course uh, missile defense system uh, that the U.S. wanted to put in South Korea uh, not to protect South Koreans per se, but to protect the U.S. military bases in South Korea. And so this, this also created an interesting dynamic uh, where South Koreans were being penalized for a capability that the U.S. wanted to put there to protect U.S. interests. Um, so how does, how does this play in? Well, I, I think uh, 
that, that uh, and this also gets to the, the question about how Chinese interests are changing, I think that the, the, the chances for China to have it both ways uh, at this point are, are fleeting. Um, and uh, I, I think the, the, my understanding, and you know, again, talking to only a small subset of, of uh, Chinese colleagues, um, a sense that the, the pressure on South Korea on Thad didn't work. It didn't have the intended outcome. Uh, and in fact, maybe made the problem worse uh, in terms of uh, Chinese influence on, on South Korea. Um, and so, you know, the, the Chinese game at this point appears to be, you know, uh, pressure North Korea more, not to the point of, of regime change uh, or, you know, uh, desperation, um, uh, but enough that it kind of obviates the, the U.S. and South Korean pressure to do, to do something. Um, now, the interesting question here is, um, if my uh, analysis is wrong and um, there isn't military option or military, uh, ec um, the U.S. doesn't exercise some military option, but also doesn't talk, and so we're left with this really sort of uh, unstable situation uh, in which the U.S. and South Korea take additional steps. Um, perhaps uh, the U.S. accedes to South Korean interests uh, deploy tactical nuclear weapons there. What does China do then? Um, because that starts to impact on Chinese uh, interests also. Um, and that's hard to predict, uh, I think. It depends a little bit on what lessons they may or may not have learned uh, about this prior experience. Um, uh, in terms of whether China is getting tough or not, um, I think it's Th there's data that suggests that they're turning the screws a little bit more on sanctions and that the sanctions seem to be having some bite uh, in North Korea. But a lot of that economic data comes with caveats um, because it's, it's not necessarily good data. Uh, and it's also the case that the Bite in North Korea may only just be beginning, and it's actually, um, you know, the, there's uh, sort of offsets that the um, lack of Chinese purchase of uh, seafood and uh, coal um, is, has uh, artificially bolstered the market in, in North Korea and, and made things seem better than they actually are. Um, uh, and so the, the North Korean about face may not be driven by pressure, um, but may be brilliant tactics. And I think we need to include that, that possibility. Um, and if you read what North Korean state, you know, the North Korean statements over time, they said a year ago that they were going to do this. And they did. And they said that they were going to shift course once they completed their deterrence and they were going to focus on developing the economy. And that seems to be what they're suggesting to, uh, to include through engagement. Uh, with South Korea. Um, so I, I, I think we need to be careful about the, the thesis that this is a pressure-driven uh, about face. Um, and just as a, a side comment on the India-Pakistan point um, and their sort of lack of speedy delivery of uh, uh, or, uh, development of delivery vehicles, um, their requirements are much shorter range. Uh, and so you don't have to spend a lot of effort to develop something that's really complicated that flies uh, 6,000 miles. Um, you need something that flies, you know, 1,000 kilometers, which is much uh, less technically demanding. And so I think for North Korea, the race was really to develop a capability uh, to threaten the United States. Uh, and that's why there's been such an emphasis uh, and, and pace of, uh, of testing. Um, whether North Korea would export or not. Now, they've exported in the past, and so we can't rule out that possibility. But I think it's been pretty firmly communicated to North Korea um, to, including, to include by uh, Chinese officials that that is fundamentally a red line. Now, what the potential consequence for crossing that red line is, I have no idea. And whether that is a credible consequence or not remains to be seen. Um, but I think that's been pretty firmly communicated. Okay, we've got 15 minutes. I've got, a question. I've got two questions way in the back. So please go ahead. And one in front. So. Sometimes market up and down in Pacific stock market because some uh, military exercise uh, or Chinese uh, announcement of 
uh, precaution measure for uh, potential nuclear war. Okay, my question is this. I realized one, one, one of this fact that if you notice the previous two Chinese presidents, which is uh, at Jiang time and uh, Jiang Zemin time and Hu Jintao time, they have sent uh, both, uh, they both have sent convoy uh, to North Korea and uh, convoy managed to meet the top leader at the time. And we noticed one news that this year, uh, Xi, President Xi also sent one convoy to North Korea, but the, uh, was uh, rejected to, by the, to, to meet the top leader of North Korea. And maybe some of the Chinese analysis say this is actually a very provoke, uh, provocative actions to China. So do you think that's, uh, my question is like, do you think China may actually potentially Cooperate, co uh, cooperate with United States in this case. Maybe uh, also leave out uh, the potential uh, options to use military options uh, to dismantle the regime. In this case, with uh, with uh, agreements between China and the United States and Russia, yeah. the three major states in the United Nations. Hi, I'm um, Christy. I'm a cyber intelligence analyst. Um, and uh, my question is, is focused towards non-proliferation risks associated with DPLK program. Like the DPLK have been like pretty, you know, busy when it comes down to missile proliferation. Like they, you know, they're pretty well known for that. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the wider concerns has been echoed a lot by McMaster in the past couple of weeks is that uh, DPLK could use their own nuclear program as a springboard for FR nuclear proliferation around the region and potentially further abroad into the Middle East and so on. Like how real do you think that threat is, given the, the you know, potentially massive risks um, for DPRK of doing that, if they were, you know, a, a nuclear weapon managed to find its way into a non-state actor's uh, hands? My name is David White. Uh, I'm not a professional academic, but I've lived in Asia for 28 years, and I work for a major bank in risk management. And uh, in today's or yesterday morning's New York Times, in the upper right-hand column, it was basically an article that said that North Korea has taken South Korea for a ride, and that they uh, they could have talked about the Olympics uh, a year ago or more. And that ties in with other articles I've read that um, the, the main aim, it's, uh, these other articles suggest the main aim of North Korea is to separate uh, the United States from South Korea. And I think they're getting a lot of encouragement from, from our I won't use any adjectives from from our president. Um, that uh, that I mean they 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 need the nuclear threat to do this. But uh, the, the thrust of articles I've read is that if they can just get the U.S. to to move apart, and then then they can sort of put an an, an ultimatum on the table. Uh, what do you say about uh, about that theory? And, and, and what Trump's doing to contribute to it. Sure. Um, on the question about the Chinese envoys to, to North Korea and, and you know, will, will China cooperate with the U.S., um, I mean, I, I, like I said before, I think they've, they've had a hierarchy of interests um, that has largely preferenced uh, stability in North Korea uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, one, wanting to avoid uh, you know, a refugee crisis, two, North Korea being kind of a useful thorn uh, in, uh, in the side of the U.S. and, and South Korea. Um, um, but I think there, there's a sense in China now that um, the calculated <coughs> risk of, of North Korea is, is getting harder to, uh, to accommodate. Um, but, and, and you, you read things about, um, uh, you know, Chinese academics, saying openly that China needs to th plan for uh, uh, the collapse of the North Korean regime and that uh, and arguing that that should be discussed with the US um, which is you know academic saying that obviously is one thing government officials is, is another thing I, I tend to be a little bit skeptical uh, of this I think um, there's a certain amount you know for, for the Chinese as long as, a few particular risks can be managed. The status quo isn't terrible for, for China. Um, you know, North Korea continues to have some utility. Uh, that may be a little <coughs> bit cynical, but um, I think it's highly unlikely that they would uh, 
cooperate with some effort to dismantle the regime uh, by force. Uh, if the regime starts to fail, that's a different story. Right? If, if, uh, if there's a US DPRK contingency, uh, China probably has its own hand to play there um, opportunistically, but wouldn't, I, I think it's unlikely would, would help precipitate uh, that outcome. Uh, on the question about non-proliferation risks uh, and nuclear exports, uh, like I said, I think this, it's, it's been pretty robustly communicated to North Korea that that is not acceptable. The, the problem is, again, it, we, we make a lot of threats against North Korea, and, and how do they internalize those, and which do they think are real threats versus not real threats, uh, and can we deliver on the potential consequences of following through on, on those threats? And I think this is where the problem is, is that we've said that that's not acceptable, but it's not clear how we back that up. Now, we have a you know, reasonably robust uh, regime in place to try to make that much harder uh, through interdiction and, and these kinds of act activities. Um, and it, it seems likely that if the current trajectory, notwithstanding the North-South talks, uh, continues, that um, you know, one additional measure of, of pressure that we could see on North Korea is much greater interdiction of, of shipping. Um, it will make that threat much harder for North Korea to, to carry out. Um, but it's still there. And, and like I said, I think the, the longer particularly if North Korea is perceived to be successful in this strategy against the U.S. Uh, and, and is uh, um, you know, able to, to coerce the U.S., uh, other states would find that attractive too uh, and, and probably are willing to pay quite a bit of money to, to have that capability. Um, Non-state actor I think is a less likely threat. Um, when you think about the money and effort uh, and pain that North Korea has gone through to develop this capability, um, they're going to be pretty careful about where it goes uh, and, and the consequences of that. Uh, and then lastly, on, on um, you know, the, the wedging strategy that, that North Korea has uh, between the US and South Korea, there is a lot of concern um, uh, in South Korea and in the US that uh, North Korea has not given up on the hope of reunifying the peninsula by force. Um, and so this is part of my prescription of focusing more on defensive measures to raise the costs of, of uh, North Korea attempting to, to do that. Um, but the biggest variable uh, in the wedge, um, so that the target of the wedge is mostly South Korea, the biggest variable is the US. Uh, and if the US looks like an unreliable ally or an ally that carries with it uh, unacceptable risks um, because it might uh, provoke conflict, um, then I think that strategy it can be more successful. In this sense, this, is, this goes to my point that this overture by Kim Jong-un could be brilliant tactics, um, that uh, they're you know, very much playing on the desire of the South Korean president to have engagement um, and uh, the concern among South Koreans that the US uh, is uh, potentially going to start something uh, that uh, would bring a lot more harm to South Korea than to the United States, uh, and not necessarily consult South <coughs> Korea in the process. Um, and uh, I think the, the statements by President Trump in this regard, it's, it's, it's one thing to have a strategy of holding coercive uh, threats uh, in reserve. Uh, it's another thing to, uh, you know, the, the analogy of uh, walk softly and carry a big stick. Well, if you walk loudly, uh, and carry a big stick, then that doesn't, you know, it doesn't have the same effect. Uh, and I think that's the concern there. Okay, uh, <clears throat> we've got a couple of minutes. Uh, can I uh, uh, suggest, uh, you know, that there is in fact uh, uh, one branch of academic literature that you could look at, to be honest, and this is uh, the work by Charles Osgood, the social psychologist, who during the Cold War did talk about uh, ways of reassuring adversaries in a graduated way. And so this is the, the grit strategy, graduated in, I think, reciprocated initiatives in building trust or some such uh, uh, thing. That's what grit stands for. So it seems to me, I mean, how to operationalize grit? I mean, one of the things Osgood suggests is that you have to, um, to initiate, you've got to make some concessions that do appear to be somewhat costly mm -hmm. or potentially costly, but uh, could be recoupable some that are not really recoupable to, to show that it's not a mere tactic. Um, 
So I wonder if there's something that Osgood's work, uh, which is written in the Soviet uh, US context, uh, might help you uh, in terms of something, you know, because he, he developed it out of his experimental work with groups and, and uh, sort of, uh, you know, um, in, in laboratories and mm -hmm. things like that. So there's a kind of empirical and, and uh, theoretical base there. Yeah. But leaving aside that more arcane issue, um, I mean, you've talked quite a bit about reassurance. But I guess I, I wanted to get you to say a bit more about what would be reassuring things that you could really do. I mean, um, you could back away from saying too much. That's a kind of reassurance. Uh, stop the noise uh, somewhat. Um, is doing nothing um, a kind of reassurance? I mean, the North Koreans are not actually seemingly asking for anything very positive for either the South Koreans or the Americans to do. So just back off and ignore them as much as possible, um, uh, instead of constantly promising to take some punitive action or whatever. So is do nothing a kind of reassurance? I mean, is it plausible to uh, somehow signal that the international community is fairly comfortable with the regime as, I mean, they're legitimate and legal and you can have your half of the South Korean peninsula? Uh, is, that, is, is there any problem with that beyond? Uh, is, th is the signing of the peace treaty finally plausible? I mean, um, and um, what about um, another, something beyond a bit of reassurance, which is the Jimmy Carter option, uh, or uh, who's the basketball player option, you know, yeah. uh, so that Can there's somebody who's plausibly deniable as a mediator uh, who goes in to start something, so you don't have to send Tillerson and, and so on. Mm -hmm. I mean, is, is there a whole bag of tricks here that you would sign on to? Mm -hmm. Um, so on the on the um, Osgood, um, I, I had, like I said, more more notes than time, and, and including some things from uh, neuroscience and social psychology mm -hmm. that that uh, back up the value of reassurance um, yeah. uh, and from just a human behavior point of view. M most of which international relations theory does not uh, accommodate, um, and so I think it's 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 useful to look to some of these other uh, ideas. Um, I think the. The challenge of the costly concession here is what that implies for deterrence. And the, at this particular moment, I think uh, the, it will be very difficult for the US to take some step that is seen as attenuating deterrence in, in some way. Um, and the thing that North Korea has consistently said that it wants is to be recognized as a legitimate state with nuclear weapons. Mm. They want the India deal, basically, right? Uh, we're not going to give them the India deal. Um, and so, you know, figuring out how to to work in that space is is, is Why really Why not give them the India? Um, I, 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 for a variety of reasons. Um, one, you know, India never joined the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, and it's kind of a historical anomaly that, uh, you know, it's not part of the, the, the system. Uh, by and large, India has not proliferated to other states. Um, it exists in the international system as a, as a, a fairly productive actor. Um, uh, whereas North Korea w was in the NPT, violated its safeguards agreement, left the NPT kind of under clouded circumstances. And so it's, you, you can't validate that model. Um, by rewarding it, uh, essentially. Uh, and so this is the problem about talking to North Korea um, in, in terms that would convey legitimacy to it being a state with nuclear weapons. We're going to have to figure out how to thread the needle between um, recognizing them as a state that has nuclear weapons and therefore we need to achieve sec security and stability without recognizing them as a state with nuclear weapons in terms of international legitimacy when that's really what they're after. Uh, and so this gets to your question also about the, the signaling and, and doing nothing. Um, you know, figuring out in this context how to do that um, in the face of fairly constant provocation from North Korea. You know, doing nothing is just really not a, a very good option. Uh, and you know, we also had these demands from South Korea to, to, to do something. Um, and so it's just, it's I think hard to, to figure out um, you know, how we could just ignore the, the problem, uh, if you will. Um, crisis is part of North Korea's strategy. Um, uh, 
there's a, a, a good book uh, written by a, a Japanese academic um, that has studied how North Korea uses uh, military diplomatic crises for very specific diplomatic objectives. Uh, and I think that the, its nuclear behavior fits very well uh, in that model. Um, so how do, we, how do we signal what I've, I've suge uh, suggested? Um, you know, one, I think words matter, but words aren't enough. Um, and uh, we don't have to freeze military exercises, which North Korea has said are a threat. Um, we can change the, the character of military exercises in a way uh, that should make it less obviously a threat. Um, you know, focusing on uh, denying uh, certain kind of uh, invasion scenarios or things like that. Um, Dennis Rodman. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure he's a credible mediator, <laughs> uh, as much as Kim Jong Un likes him. Uh, but I, I think there there is a, a problem at this point, though, that we've you know the the channels for communication um, that had existed are few at this point. Uh, you have you know, the, the New York Channel uh, through, and then the um, UN Under Secretary General was recently uh, in Pyongyang. So there, there are some, but, and, and this goes to the, the point made earlier, those are with people around the regime. Nobody talks to Kim Jong-un except Dennis Rodman. So how do you, how do you s penetrate the, 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 the guard and actually have, you know, a dialogue with him? That's, that's really hard. Well, Trump said he would pick up the phone at some point. Any but, uh, day now. Guess, I'm sorry, I have to end it at 6.32, and uh, he's had a very, very long uh, couple of days coming all the way straight into a conference, and I think probably there are other people who need to leave as well. So thank you very much. I think uh, uh, rich in some ideas about what can be done, really, and what the nature of the problem is uh, that you've uh, really analyzed quite uh, acutely. Um, thanks for doing this, and thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a serious problem, and. Uh, I guess uh, we're going to have to see how things develop in 